Let us start with the motivation. You have seen this slide. Actually, I took it from Sabina's presentation. Why? Why are we here? Why, why do we want to have a new measure? Because it fulfills a set of interest, a set of reasons. That are those. Because we are looking for an intuitive measure. We don't, we don't want to have a measure that complicates our life that is impossible to communicate to people because we want to have information at different levels. Probably the president is worried about the poverty at the national level, our situation compared with our neighbor countries, or maybe the situation across the region. But the minister, he doesn't want that. The minister wants to know what is happening in his own field, in health, in education, and so on. And probably the mayor of a municipality, a county, whatever, he's interested about their own situation. What else? Because that's value. We cover with Sabina the idea of capabilities, the capability approach, and the idea of seeing development not only as an economic function, a function of income, because it generates incentives, because it's flexible, because it's robust and it's academically rigorous. So what we did? The first step was, let's choose the purpose. And we tried to choose the purpose. We we're saying we want to measure poverty, we want to monitoring the policies of the government, we want to evaluate a specific policy, and we define a unit. It's crucial. That was we spent our Saturday, our entire Saturday, trying to explore this, just this. Why? Probably you have seen this. Can you read it? These are different ways how to see the project. Probably the sponsor thought like the project was like that. The request wanted something like that. The designer thinks, maybe I will do it like this. The programmers, the state expert, will give you something like that. With a lot of loops and things, a lot of experiments and so on. The user side shows you, no, you should do it like this. It's the best of it. What we were looking? We were looking for something as simple as that. The purpose will guide all our steps. That is crucial. And that's why we spend a lot of time. But after that, we move quite quickly to the selection of dimensions, indicators, deprivation, weights, and poverty cutoff. And we were talking, no, I think that the education should be six years, no, seven years, eight years, nine years. And we moved that to state. <laughs> Something happened. We took all the decisions. We said, these are our units, these are our dimensions, indicators. We put everything in a blender, and we got a number. So the first step of this session is try to understand what we have been doing in a simple way. First, I will try to use this vocabulary that I suppose that you understand and you get at this point. But I will start from the beginning. We start with a matrix. Actually, our first session, your first session on Tuesday, if I don't make a mistake, it was using this matrix or a similar one. Achievement matrix, we call it. And we have four individuals. In this case, Ana, Joao, Maria, Antonio. And we have different achievements in income, education, uh, housing index, malnourished. And for each one of these indicators, we have deprivation cutoff. Indicators, deprivation cutoff. What was the first step? Who is the prize? We went to Stata 
And we saw something like this. Tap water with weights and everything, and we saw, oh, we have people with pipe water, tap water, and so on. What was our next step? Try to transform those achievements, the situation of the, the water conditions, in zeros and one. The situation of income, years of education, housing, and nutrition. And we did that. We transformed each one of those achievements in the in deprivations, if you were deprived, in ones, and zeros if you are not deprived. In a state, it was something like that. You have all the possible categories, and you said, oh, these are non-deprived, these are deprived. So far, we finish Saturday with the deprivation matrix. We were around this point. In this data, if you see this, it was something like that. The water condition, you are deprived or not, situation, an individual or household. What was the next step? When we have all the zeros and one, we could see the data. Remember, each one of these observations is a individual or is a household. You can see them. You can understand them. You can, if you track them, you can see that it's a family with two kids or two, any structure. And from there, we get the deprivation matrix. The difference is we don't have only four individuals. We have 5,000, 20,000 individuals. That is data. What was the next step yesterday? Let's give, let's give to each one of these conditions a weight. I use the simplest one. Same weight to, to each one. The first dimension, 25%. The second dimension, or oh, second indicator, 25%, and so on. Simple. Question so far. All the questions that you want. This is the moment that we are trying to consolidate all the things that you have been absorbing during these days. Happy. So what was the next step? Try to do the same in the stata. In the stata, we were trying to multiply each deprivation matrix for their, the weight of each dimension. And we got something like that. We were dealing with missing values, assigned zeros or one in some cases, but we got something like this. We calculate our counting vector. In our matrix was just sum the situations for each dimension and for each individual. In a stata, we did exactly the same. Dimensions, counting vector. Yesterday and today, what we have been trying to do, try to measure each one of the aggregated measures. The first one, the head count. Well, let's try to understand what the stata is doing. Maybe it will help us to understand what are we trying to show. This is the counting vector. So individual two is deprived in 50% of their dimensions, individual three is deprived in the 100% of their dimensions, individual four is deprived in 25% of their dimensions. If the K, the cutoff, the poverty cutoff is 30%, is he poor? No. Poor? 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> He's not poor. What are we doing? We're trying to collect only one tiny piece of information. If this individual, each one of these individual, is poor with a cutoff of 30. Not poor, 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 non poor. What, how can we see that in the stata? We summarize. 
What do we get when we summarize this? 50%. 50% of the population is poor with a cutoff of 30%. That is, the state is doing this. In the iteration, in the loop that we have seen, for value k equals 10 brackets, 10 of 200 is doing the same thing. When the cutoff is 60, what is the software doing? It's saying, okay, is he poor or non poor? Non poor because the counting vector, he or she, is the prime only, not only, in zero. Poor or non poor? Poor or non poor? Poor or non poor? Non poor. So when we calculate, when we summarize this value, you get immediately the percentage of individuals in poverty with a cutoff of 30%. In Stata, it's like this. You did it exactly the same. And if you see your own data, you will, have, you will get the same kind of figures. You will have your cutoff, and you will have, for instance, at 20%, none of them is poor. But he's poor. He's poor. Questions? What was the next step? Let's try to calculate the intensity. And the, in the intensity, we follow a similar structure or pattern. We're saying, please, if you are poor, give me a dot. If you are non, sorry, if you are non poor, give me a dot. Give me a missing. But if you are poor, Give me the counting vector. We are censoring to some extent. When the cutoff is 30, is he or she poor? No. So, a dot. Is he or she poor? Yes. So, we we'll repeat the number. Is he or she poor? Yes. Repeat the number. And so on. What is the intensity or the average deprivation share? It's nothing else than the average of these two. 1.5 divided by 2, 75%. Individuals in average with a cutoff of 30% are deprived in 75% of their dimensions. Stata. The same process. This individual is deprived in 75%. 1% of the possible dimensions. For everyone else, dots. For him, the level of deprivation. With M0, it was the next step. The same, the same counting, but what is the difference? If you are non poor, I want a zero. I need to censor you. I need to tell, I will count you. I will count all of you. But if you are not poor, you will be a zero. You will not affect me my measure of poverty, but you will be considered. So, first individual, no poor, so zero. Second individual, poor, the counting vector, and so on. What is this? The average of this number. That's why we use summarize. We are summarizing just these numbers. And it gives us directly the M0, the H, the A. Questions? In a stata, it's like this. Before we had dots, now we have zeros. Questions? Sensor headcount. Imagine that we define a cutoff, a poverty cutoff of 30%. That means that we will consider as poor only those individuals who are deprived in 30 or more of their dimensions. So what happened with him? He's not poor. Poor, poor, non-poor. 
What is the difference of the sensor head count? The sensor head count provides information of each dimension, but censoring for those who are not poor. Simple. Before, the raw head count. Let's compare the raw head count with the sensor head count. Before, the raw head count of income, it was two. Imagine that here there is an individual. There are two out of four. 50% of the population is deprived in income. Raw head count. Let's see in years of education. Years of education, two individuals out of four are deprived in education. 50% of our population is deprived in education. Raw head count. What is the difference with the sensor head count? We don't care about these guys. Simple. We are saying only one out of four, 25% of the population. Again? Perfect. It's multidimensionally poor and deprived. What? Sorry? If I'm not dealing with the non-poor? Yeah, the first person. Why didn't you delete it? The first person. Ah, the first person because he was not poor. He, he was never poor. So I consider him to calculate the average. Because imagine, it's a fraction. It's a ratio. At the bottom, you had the total population. At the top, you have the percentage of deprived individuals and poor individuals. That's all. So, sensor headcount, the number or the percentage of people deprived and poor at the same time in each dimension, in income, two out of four. Education, one out of four. Housing, one out of four. Nutrition, one out of four. Those are our sensor headcount. Why are those sensor headcount relevant? For the following. Remember, just remember, that your M0 is 0375. Look, if you multiply your sensor headcount for the weights of each one, remember that each one has 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. What do we get? Huh? M0. We get M0 immediately. So one way to check your results when you are working with uh, data is I will get all the sensor headcount, I multiply for the weight of each dimension, the sum will give me M0. Simple. What is the next step? The same number that we, I, I just showed you, I will divide it by the M0. What do we get? The percentage contribution of each dimension. So now, each dimension would not contribute to M0. They will contribute to 100%. That is all the thing that we have been doing. Questions. The first part of this session is try to understand step by step what we have been doing. Let's go to the second part. <coughs> Interpretation. Can you read? This chart indicates that the big hand is on the 12th and the small hand is on the 5th. Who knows what that means? One thing is to have the data. 
I'm pretty sure that you have Excel files, data files, do files, full of numbers. Yeah, and now we have to share it. Now we have to get something from that. To run is something, to run the do file and to get the results in a rigorous way, in a good way, is important. But the interpretation is also important. That's why, for instance, you will have tomorrow an extra working groups session that you use it to analyze your data, to find the, the ideas behind the data, what you can get from those results. Not only to get more results, but to understand them. A few recommendations. First, try to understand your dimensions and indicators. Try to create a profile. Try to understand in each individual. We did that for the global MPI. We were trying first with this simple diagram to show, look, these are the dimensions. And implicitly saying, we believe that health, education, and living standards, they are similar. They have the same weight. When you see that, and you are not expert, you see, ah, they are at the same level. What do you see when you are ex an expert? They have the same weight. These variables, they have the same level. They have the same weight. But here, something is different. You are saying, without putting numbers, parts of your measure. You are communicating parts of your measure. Additionally, we develop profiles. When you are creating your data, go to the field and put names on these conditions. You put names and you classify. Someone who is depriving A, B, C, and D is poor. Because, and you justify, because we define our cutoff in a 33%, this individual is poor because he or she is deprived of more than 33% of our dimension. But also, present your formula, this simple formula. I will skip this slide because I want to start with H and A first. We know that the MPI could be decomposed in the head count and the intensity. The head count is the incidence. As simple as we have been learning about the income poverty. It's the percentage of individuals who are poor in a society. Technically, you are saying is the percentage of individuals who are living in household, in, a, in poor households in a society where the poverty is defined by the 33% of their dimension. Technically, you cannot share that. Because it, what did he say? It's the same thing that I would use the, the parallel with income. What do we do in income? In income we say, in average, per capita, the income is this. And the limit is here. When we say 30% of the population is poor in terms of income, what we are saying implicitly, 30% of the population lives in households, sorry? Below, Below the threshold or the poverty line, which is different to say 30% of the individuals are poor. However, in general, it's commonly agreed that we will call the intensity as the simplest measure, the measure that it says the percentage of people who are poor under a specific cutoff. And the intensity is how poor they are in simple terms. So the measure, the M0, is telling us something extremely simple, which is 
the percentage of individuals in poverty, but adjusted, but how poor they are. With examples, probably we will see it uh, a bit more in detail. Questions? Following the example of the global MPI, we have a set of individuals and 10 dimensions, or 10 indicators, sorry. We agree that these are our counting vector. He is poor, poor, and poor. Our headcount ratio is three out of four. 75% of our population is poor. How poor they are, simple. The average of those numbers, these individuals are poor in 59% of the possible dimensions. The M0 is 0 0.442. Question. Why is that important? And I will show you the case of Nepal. Imagine Nepal. By the way, if you find new ways how to show this in terms of graphs, it's also extremely welcome. Do it. For instance, we create a two-axis graph. Here we have the incidence or the head count, and here we have the intensity. And we put Nepal in that corner. Why? Because Nepal, in Nepal, 64% of the population is poor with a cutoff of 33.3% and they are deprived in average in 54% of the possible dimensions. Okay, but only one single point doesn't give us so much information. When we, but when we compare two years it provides a bit of information. For instance, these are the two years for Nepal, 2006 and 2011. If we focus our attention only on the MPI, we will say, oh, okay, we're better off. Poverty is falling. But where is the source of that process? in both directions. We can see that the percentage of poor people is falling and the intensity is falling as well. I'm starting with the simplest cases. We are trying to elaborate based on that. Imagine that we have more countries. These are results for the last MPI. You have to be at the same time, honest and strict. Can we compare data? It's difficult. Look, we are using data of 2003 in the case of Sri Lanka, 2011 in the case of Nepal. Can we do the same when we do our research in our countries? Probably not. When we have to decide a policy, probably not. What do we get as well? Sensor headcount. These are the sensor headcount for Nepal. And you should be able to present them on, on Friday, saying like 20, let's do it. Please, could you help me? Sensor headcount of 20.3 in the case of a schooling. What does it mean? This is sensor headcount, so yeah. out of total population. Perfect. 20.3% uh, are deprived of the schooling. And? and the poor. Perfect. Could you help me? With the school attendance? Out of total population, 8.1% is deprived in the school. What do we do after is when we have those values, 
we start showing them in a simpler way. These are the sensor headcount. We could show them like numbers or we could show them like a, like a graph. What is the best? Like a graph. We could say immediately, hmm, probably these are the most common issues among the poor. These are the less common issues among the poor. When we get all the numbers, probably we'll not see anything. What do we do after? Contribution by dimension. Does it help that bar if, if you put only the bar? I'm sure on Friday, at least one group will show a bar like this. I say like, okay, contributions. <laughs> what do we need? We need more information. We need to explain that. For instance, here you have three different, sorry, five different regions. Even, so to make clear the, the differences, we put a line. So you, are, you clearly see this is the first dimension, second dimension, third dimension. We use different colors. Greens are living standards and so on. But these give us only a, an idea. It doesn't give us all the information. Why? Because the Western is only, represent only that percentage of poverty. Remember that you, you calculate the, the absolute contribution and the percentile contribution? If you put in a graph the percentile, you will get something like this. If you put in a graph the absolute, the, sorry, the absolute contribution like this and the percentile contribution, you will get something like that. What is the problem of this? It doesn't give you information about how poor is each region. You just get that all regions are the same and the distribution, the contribution of each dimension is different. This one is your level of poverty. This one, you cannot compare. It's so difficult co to compare. Tan. Well, maybe for me it's difficult, but there, in the there are options to select 100% <coughs> part with the size of the poverty. Yeah, it happens that if you have, which is common, probably you have seen in your data set, the capital area or the capital region has poverty like this. And the southern region is like this. So when you try to compare, okay, what is, ah, this is education. Yeah, I can see it clearly. Use both. Also, with the bubbles, you can show more information. Remember that I showed you Nepal 2006, Nepal 2011? Now, I can decompose 2011 and 2006 by region. What does it show? Western Mountain in 2011 is worse than the whole country in 2006. Start giving me ideas. And those ideas are crucial when I talk with the journalist, when I talk with the press. They are looking for things like that. They are looking for this kind of details. And also it helps us. It shows us that probably there is a cluster in that area. Probably there is another cluster here, another cluster there. They are moving together for some reason. So far with the data, when we analyze cross-sectional data, it's so difficult to get what is behind that. But it gives us an idea. It helps us to define what is the next research question. As you were asking in the, about chronicity, chronicity by itself doesn't give you all the answers. But we were saying that in Indonesia, Probably the best 
the best way to see if someone was resistant, resilient to poverty, it was if you had assets, specifically jewelry. So if you are able to accumulate assets in previous periods, any kind of asset, probably it would be so difficult for you to fall into poverty. So probably it will not give us the last solution. Okay, let's give assets to everyone. But it gives us an idea of the next step or the next piece of research. So one thing is to analyze this. We're analyzing changes in aggregated measures between two periods. But that doesn't give us the whole picture. As Anna was mentioning, we need to see what is happening in each dimension. In each dimension, we have to build indicators showing, look, assets is falling in five points. Floor is falling in three point something points, and so on. Actually, those changes are used for Colombia to check the performance of the ministers. Are saying, are we reducing or are we not reducing the sensor headcount of your specific dimension? Is yeah? Is that messy? It's messy, I know, but I wanted to put. Please feel free to change it. You don't have to follow a specific structure. Feel free to propose a new idea to say, look, I think that if we present these same numbers in a, another structure, it would be better. Do it. It will help all of us. For instance, we didn't have this a few years ago, and someone come up, OK, why we don't put two the graphs, the MPI, in two axis graphs with head count and intensity. Oh, makes sense. For instance, when you are comparing two countries or three countries, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Ghana, 2000, 2003, and 2003 in all cases. Why do I want to show you this? Because when you are comparing countries, you have to go a bit further. When you compare Yemen and India, who is poorer? Who is the poorest country in this example? Why? You need to provide all the information, and you need to accept that sometimes you cannot reach a full conclusion. You need to go further. In this case, the MPI is the same. So we will say the level of multidimensional poverty for those countries is exactly the same. Region 1 and Region 2, country 1, country 2. We have to go to give the next step. What is the next step? Let's check the age. Oh. Yemen seems to seem to have less poor population than India. And it's the opposite case. And what happened with the intensity? Sorry, I couldn't hear the, the first time. Can you Perfect. We are start getting information. I'm not saying that this is the final step, but we are start to fishing around or however 
when we are comparing countries and regions, try to add something else. We have the MPI, we have the headcount, we have the intensity. But in so many cases, it would be really crucial if you put the number of individuals that we're talking about. 52% of the population in the case of Yemen are 11,000 individuals. 53% of the population in India are more than half a million. When you are working for the government, that is relevant. The amount of money that you need for each program is different, as you can see. Check your regions. Yeah, sorry. I, my mistake, it's in thousands. And then we can do, we can go even further. Imagine that we have the poor population. And we know that, sorry to use you, all of you are poor. <laughs> Is that enough? And even more, I tell you, all of you are poor and the average poverty is 50%. Yeah, okay. I could tell you, ah, okay, and you are deprived or the, the contribution of it. All dimensions is the same. Can we get with those simple facts a bit more information? In general, if we use the sensor or the counting vector, yes, we could get more information. In this graph, we show you different structures. These are only the poor population. These individuals are deprived between 33 and 39% of their dimensions. So I have the poor population. I'm saying you are deprived in between 33 and 39. You are deprived between 40 and 49. You 50 and 59, any number, any group that you want. But what I'm saying, I'm saying this is the intensity of your poverty for different groups. I know that this percentage of individuals are deprived in all possible dimensions. And only these, in only one, or a bit more than one. It gives us more information. Why do we need more information? For the same reasons that we saw at the beginning because we need to analyze that, we need to share that. That's why one of our biggest mistakes as a researchers is we tend to talk for researchers. We talk for statisticians or in conferences and that kind of, for that kind of audience. But when we do that, is because we want to change something. So you want to change the idea of policymakers, of the press, of the media, of the population. And you should be able to share the information in a, let's say in a nice way, and in a close way, in a, in a way that everyone is able to understand what is happening. First, a few recommendations that we learned from, sorry, go ahead. All right, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is when we compare countries, uh, I think and one of your presentation is saying that we don't compare countries we have with different year surveys. Yeah. And uh, I saw some in your presentation you compared 2000 HS with the okay. HS. Yeah. And uh, to come up with that also, uh, and also assessing the progress of a single country, that is two time. You were using Nepal in 2006 and Nepal in 2011. I still have another problem uh, in the sense of what they say, we have economic uh, crisis between the two periods. We do not, uh, we may not have you no know, like deprivations, but again, the schooling will be there, it's only the economic aspect that are having that is a crisis. And again, we fail to see that. And we mean the API increase, are we going to say deprivation increase because of that? How does the across time analysis? Because I think 
one of, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi was against the critics against MPI was that he faced to capture the economic crisis that are between two time periods. So how does comparing progress through time so I'm come to that point? Thank you for the question. The first part, when you compare two countries and two different years, it's complicated, it's a mess. You need to be so careful with your conclusions. You cannot say that is happening for X or Y reason because the years of comparison are different. So when you are trying to build national measures, try to use only one period. Even sometimes we have surveys that are from the field work was between September of one year till May of the second year. And you are comparing individuals <laughs> across the, all that huge period. The seasonality is completely different. We try to do that, but we are hoping to have closer data. Yeah, I absolutely agree that it's a, it's a problem to mix data of 2003 and 2010. Uh, and hopefully you will have data of the same year first. At least the next two or three years, or the closer. We have been doing that for years. Even in income poverty, we still use data for 2000. Yeah. Sad. And, and one part of our work is try to push for better data. And we will discuss about that in, in a few days. Regarding your second question, the Comparability. Inside of the MPI, I'm not talking about the global MPI, because the old global MPI had a lot of restrictions in terms of the variables that you could include. But a normal MPI has different kind of data. Some of them, as you say, they will not move with crisis. For instance, education. If one year you get five years of education, the second period, it doesn't matter what happened in the middle. It doesn't, happen, it doesn't matter if it's, there is a crisis or there is a earthquake. You will still have five years. That variable will not change. But there are other variables that they will change. For instance, if uh, we were analyzing the case of uh, Haiti for the earthquake, what happened? Your housing is changing. Your housing is able to capture the change of that variable. And that is the, the nice thing about the, the multidimensional indicator. You have both components. After a crisis, you have things that they remain the same, but others that are worse enough or uh, you are changing conditions. Trying to capture both is really is the crucial part of the MPI. In that case, probably I would suggest you check the different indicators. Because you will see different patterns. You will see education remaining almost the same. Probably if you have a dimension close to employment, you will see boom, a change like that. For our results in, in Europe, we found that. In Europe, you have a set of indicators defined by, by Eurostat. One of them is work intensity. Since 2006, you can see this change. In other dimensions, you don't see that change. So when you aggregate, you get information. But to analyze in a proper way, you also need to disaggregate to understand the full picture. Uh, and last thing that, that is extremely relevant and is related to my previous point. We need better data. Yeah. We need better data at all levels. <coughs> that is our main demands. When we, will, when we go to the UN meetings, when we go to the almost all meetings. Why? For instance, how do we measure unemployment? In all countries. OK, but the, the definition of unemployment. Yeah. It probably in the last in the last week. And, and and my question is, is that variable of unemployment captures all the dimensions, or all the indicators, all the different aspects of a dimension like employment? No. Probably not. We need to know about did you not only if you were last week, 
but did you have work three months ago or the quality you have social insurance or you have a, a security at work so probably the, with the variables that we are using now which are the basic ones you will not see so much change but with real variables that capture capabilities or functioning we could get more information sorry uh, before someone else had okay You have two problems in terms of size. The first one is related to the size of the country, like here. You are saying 50, 50 percent, ah, it's almost the same. The first way how to deal with that is showing the information. Look, this 52 percent means 11 million, this uh, 53 percent means 600 million. That is the first. The second with the sample size, I suppose that you are referring to when you have a lot of missing values and you have to keep only a section or a percentage of your survey? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. When you, when you put these kind of restrictions, when you say, like, I want to use the same indicators for, not only for uh, all countries, but imagine that you are analyzing the evolution of poverty in your own country. You have, imagine that you have a cross-sectional data in 1990, 1994, 98, 2000, 2005, and you want to compare them. What do you what are you trying to keep? You are trying to keep the same dimensions, the same indicators to be able to compare. But you will see that when you are going back in time, you are saying, oops, a huge percentage of those individuals, they don't have the information that I want. You have two options. Rethink your dimension or your indicator, trying to capture those individuals. Second, you could check if those individuals that you are leaving out of the the calculation has there is any bias in that selection the, we could check with each one of the groups there are some tests to check if the group that you are leaving in your measure has the same internal average for the other indicators that those who are leaving your measure that is an option that is a technical option uh, and are the two that we have been using so far. So uh, if I ask, uh, are you asking whether we have same size, sample size across different countries? What is all this? Is it different There is different, different sample size. So as long as the sample size that you're collecting from a particular country, that is not too large, so that is negligible, so if you are collecting a large sample size, that's a 50% of your country, when you are computing standard errors and everything, you need to adjust for a correction factor. But when your sample size is too small compared to the country, say India, the country is 1.2 billion, and suppose you are just computing 100,000 sample, it's negligible. Mm -hmm. It's even less than 0.01%. So the correction factor actually tends to almost tends to one. So as a result, if the sample size is very small compared to the country, in general there is no correction factor in it. They are comparable. Okay? That's the idea. We discuss it um, in chapter eight when we start the statistical inference section. Just mentioned over there. So that's why sample size difference should not the main thing is that as long as your sample is representative of the population, you can always make inferences. Okay, or conclusions based on the sample. Okay. It's only the standard error that is affected. Please. So I, I was just when you went so far, using the same data, using the same data, I was 
thinking about like uh, the country I come from. We have uh, four poverty studies at different levels. Uh, 92, 98, 2003, and 2010. Uh, but one of the biggest problems that we have is uh, the unit of analysis in each of these four are different. The first one for emphasis was really food salary index. That was the unit of analysis. The first survey was 1992. Uh, the unit of analysis was on, on food calorie intake, based on uh, the minimum calorie intake of a, of a, of a e EAU, adult equivalent unit, uh, based on that part of the world. The second survey was based on really a national poverty threshold, which calculates the, the food and the non-food basket menu, uh, also. Then the third one was really uh, based on uh, based on income, uh, and the last one recently was based on a dollar and a dollar twenty five cents cut off mark. But really, all these surveys really collected a lot of information. Uh, though maybe the focus of analysis was geared towards this unit of analysis, but I think uh, if one really have the panel of data, you should be able to really get constant uh, variables, dom uh, domains, that you can really make a comparison, I think. Is that feasible? Yeah. Thank you. In general, when you... Thank you. Give me the coffee. I could hold the camera. Uh, in general, it's quite more difficult when you don't have the same structure uh, and not the same variables. For instance, for us, it's, it's so complicated when something that simple, like type of toilet, they decided for some reason that they will put the latrines together, and we don't know now if there is which kind of latrine we're talking about. That is a complex thing, and, and probably you will have to go f a bit in detail in the data, otherwise if you cannot make a clear comparison or suggest that these are comparable for X, Y research or empirics, uh, you will have to leave it out. Uh, actually, that is real. In general, MDGs define that you are deprived in terms of toilet if your latrine has a slab or not. So those countries that they include all latrines in one single Indicator, uh, how can you say if they are, these are deprived or these are not? It's more difficult. Um, yeah. Uh, what happens with the UHS survey? DHS, DHS survey uh, bring the wealth index. I don't know if they are working or not, but <laughs> you can shout. Okay. Uh, they bring a wealth index. Uh, they bring the variable di uh, divided by quantile. Mm. What happens if I use that index in my in my dimension of uh, living standards instead of using like five variables of living standards? And could I cut off if they, they are, for example, one or two uh, quantiles? They are deprived. Okay. First, have you seen that you have a wealth index in your data sets? Those who are working with DHS? Those, that indicator is using a statistical process and it captures information on your level of asset and certain condition of the household. What was the problem is it, it doesn't follow the normative suggestion that we are suggesting first. And I, I will try to explain this in, in a few seconds. Second, if you include that indicator that captures information of assets, you should not be able to put other assets. Otherwise, you will, be, you will have a problem of double counting. Imagine the wealth indicator, if I don't make a mistake, has information about assets, about uh, toilet, I think. 
and asset of the household. And they compute using PCA index. First problem is if you use that, you cannot use toilet, you cannot use asset as an extra dimension. Otherwise, you would be double counting. You would be counting here, and you would be counting there, the same thing. Second, it doesn't follow a normative decision. Why? What is PCA doing? Statisticians do this. PCA is analyzing the data and compare the variance of different variables. And it finds, ah, OK, this variance is quite similar. And they put those variables together to create an index. What is the problem? That that not necessarily follows a normative recommendation. For instance, when we were doing PCA, sometimes you organize the variables in a way that is a bit uh, odd, at least. Um, and third, there is a practical reason. Where do you put the limit? You could say, imagine that the, the, um, the wealth index is from 1 to 10. Who is the prime? The one who has 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6. The second option, that the one that you were mentioning, was to use a relative measure, which say, if you are in the two lowest quintile, you will be deprived. That was, the problem is we will include a relative measure inside of absolute measures. So that is the, the game that you are playing. Uh, it's an option. I'm not saying that it's completely wrong, but I'm saying we didn't take it for those reasons. You could include a wealth index with those concerns. First, how to decide who is poor and who is not poor. Yeah, the, to justify the use of the wealth index is not that difficult. To justify the cutoff for that wealth index, it would be more difficult probably. It's a relative measure. You will have always the same problem with the relative measure. European Union is using 60% of the mean uh, detail. What happened with the, I don't have the data here, but what happened with Greece during the, the crisis? What do you expect in terms of poverty? Increase. Poverty for Greece, income poverty, during the crisis, change from 23.1 to 23.2. Why? They use a relative measure. So if everything gets poorer, what happens with poverty? Remains the same. Because all of them, they move together. There are pros and cons of those kind of measures. And you have to defend them if you want to go for one of those. I'm not saying that this is wrong. Actually, in the EU paper that we had with Sabina, we use a relative measure. Because we consider that for EU, it could be possible to have a relative measure. So let's return. How can we move from this analysis to the communication? And here, these are more tips than than the strong things that you should follow in all the steps of your research. First, when you are sharing those results, try to be consistent with what, the, what is happening in the society. Why? You need to put a, the users and the readers in a perspective. Try to create certain facts that you can play with them, that you can use it. Try to design metaphors. 
and try, try to try new things with care, but new things. For instance, for the international MPI, what were the, the facts like? Actually, what is our purpose? What is the main purpose of our research? We're not working about industrial composition of the trade between Chile and Argentina. We're talking about poor individuals. We're talking about people who need our, not our help, that should sound a bit patronizing, but they need to see their own situations on the newspapers. So one of the facts that we found is the poorest of the poor. The second, compare India with Africa. All the media loves when you compare, start comparing India with Africa, or India with China. That kind of things. It's like, ah, and the newspaper will call you. Try to find that little detail that you will get from your data that you will be able to share. That society or that community is the poorest of the poor, or the MPI middle income countries. Compare different data, El GDP per capita with the MPI. In your case, compare the income poverty with the multidimensional poverty. In general, the newspapers, they love this kind of thing. The other thing is try to, to generate discussion, to show them that the paradigm is wrong, that we need to think again. That happens with the, the MDGs. At some point, the, the growth commission says, you know what, the MDGs are really nice, and growth is really nice too, but they don't go together as you saw in, in the first session, why multidimensional poverty? What is that? Finding the fact, finding the information that they need to put in the, in the headline. Or you could talk about the questions. How can you find those? In your own data, the data that you have in each, one con in each of the country, play with your data. Find comparisons that you don't expect. Find the, the rabbit behind the... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. But be sure that you are rigorous. Don't start inventing things. People will, will see that you are making it up. For instance, Let's compare Pakistan with Niger. Relationship, mm, not so much. We found the poorest country in our data set with 93% of the population in poverty and average level of deprivation 69.4. And how can we compare? and someone found the relationship. I will show you the final one. That is Pakistan, on the other hand, intensity is 69%, sorry, it's still Niger. There you are we realize the following. Niger is home of 13.4 million MPI poor people with an intensity of 69%. In Pakistan, 15.5 million of the poor that they have they have the same situation that they have in the second country. What we are saying, what are we trying to say? That in this country, in Pakistan, we have the same number of people 
with the same number of or level of deprivation kill that Niger. You know, we found a connection. Sometimes it's a bit extreme connection. But from those, you are getting more information and you are getting the thing that you want to share. What else? Design structures show them or show that you can show different, you can, you can find different things from your data. We had a colleague who used to talk about the, the zoom or the resolution lens. Why? Because with your data, you could do the following. With your data, you could find this is our headcount and this is our intensity. And that is nice. This is our headcount and our intensity uh, at the national level. We are at the level of this other country according to the international NPI and so on. But also, you could go a bit further. Ah, by region. Look, we have regions that are extremely poor, like the worst countries of the MPI, but there are regions that they behave like Switzerland. You can go even further. In that region, health is like in UK. But education is like in, I don't want to use any example. <laughs> so remember always that when you are sharing this information, you're sharing information about individuals. Not only the nice distribution of, oh look, these are the poor, these are the non-poor, and so on. Behind each one of these numbers, you have individuals. You have, an observation is not only a number or, or a simple observation. It's an individual, it's a family who is behind that. And remember, that is all of the, the metaphor that we use. The MPI can be on whole. Sometimes, I don't know if you, probably you saw this with the Anna uh, a few days ago. When you are calculating the MPI, you could use like three different forms. You could first H times A, or you can calculate the average of the matrix, or you can calculate the sensor headcount and then get the, what is that? You are doing with the same piece of paper, unfolding in different ways. Find the way that is the best for you. You don't have to follow the rule or, or the, the structure of everyone else. Use graphs. Policymakers love these kind of things. Oh, look, that is the region. And use your graph in your presentations. They will help. Questions? Please. Yes. Um, I've got a question, I think, on the interpretation communication, <coughs> some kind of a practical, practical situation, which maybe would require some practical tip from you. Um, you have done all your work, a lot of work, a lot of time put in, and then you want to present to the policymakers, who are most politicians. And uh, sometimes maybe it doesn't favor the MPI, doesn't favor them, and it is thrown out. So, what practical steps can you do? Or do you have to start carrying your do file and uh, log <laughs> file to the parliament <laughs> or state house? Just trying to convince them. What uh, can you do? Or maybe have you had some kind of experience like that in the past before? Because it's quite common, I think, in my country, has happened whereby the government has rejected you results from the statistics and then the want to come up with their own. Yeah, there are different ways for to do this. So you can repeat the question. Ah, sorry. For everyone. A government could manipulate this. A government could say, yeah, but take out that variable because it makes me look bad. 
one of the, you have different ways how to deal with that. First, as a group, as a office rule, we don't work with any government with accusation of corruption. First, as a, second, but that is more for you. Uh, we push them to publish all the data and the do files in available and accessible places, especially in the website. For instance, uh, we did the indicator for the Women's Empowerment Index. Please, all the data sets should be there. All the do files should be there. So everyone, your civil society, it will be the first one knocking your door if you are doing something wrong. That is a way how to control yourself. Um, we are trying not to take a, a patronizing attitude to say like you have to do that, that, and that. We're trying to build the institutions inside of the government able to do that. For instance, examples of real life. Mexico, they decided we cannot do this inside of the government. We'll have a, another institution called Coneval and they will be in charge of the calculation, measurement, and update of the measure. Because otherwise I would say, like, oh no, this year we will take out this indicator. When you have an extra institution able to do that, you are able to control um, the quality and the rigorosity of those variables. From which other country that I remember at this point? Philippines. They are doing something similar. Uh, the, the minister and the president include inside of the plan, national plan for the Philippines include the MPI. And he defined, this is the MPI. Anyone could check it and could analyze it and could test us based on that. And the third thing, or the fourth thing, in general you can manipulate the data the first year or you can manipulate the indicators the first year. But once that you have the multidimensional poverty indicator, you cannot change it, for instance. Uh, you decide the first year that you have five indicators and seven dimensions, because that year it was perfect. What happened in the second wave? What happened in the second period? To keep those dimensions, they will not be affected by the policy. They will not change your dimensions. They will not change your indicators. And the fourth argument is there is a mistake when you think that governments want to have a lower level of poverty. Why? In general, we have seen that governments want to have a high level of poverty. Why? Because when you have a multinational poverty of 5%, it's so difficult to reduce it to 4%, to 3%. It's almost impossible. Oh, not impossible, but it's, it's extremely expensive in terms of time and resources. But when you have a poverty of 40%, it's easier. Okay. 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 Yeah. I'm not sure what will happen with Chile, but all the case. Nepal, they decided this is the income poverty. What is the cutoff for the multidimensional poverty? The cutoff who will give us the same percentage of individuals. It's a strategy that could help you as a government, if you are a corrupted government, it will help you the first time, but not the second one. You cannot change the you cannot just change the cutoff from one period to the second. We will discuss about that and we will show you more cases of real life, life applications tomorrow. We'll have a session only about institutions and, and multidimensional poverty. I just wanted to finish with a few things. Two examples. Just two examples. When you are comparing, be careful what you are comparing. As you suggest, to compare different countries in different years is difficult. So you need to be explicit. You need to say 
we are comparing data of different years. So the reader will be able to judge by himself, okay, I'm comparing, uh, we said apples and pears, so I'm comparing something that it doesn't have any sense. For instance, when we are comparing the MPI, if you want to compare the MPI with the income poverty, you should compare the head count, the age, with the age of income poverty. No, not the MPI, the M0, with the age of income poverty, because you are trying to measure the same thing. You are trying to measure percentage of people. So be careful when you are measuring. Be careful when you are explaining. And with these slides, I, I will be finishing. MPI poor people by region. Total population. What we are trying to say, we're saying, if this is the total poor people, 50% lives in South Asia. But if we consider the whole population, only 29% lives in South Asia. You need to be explicit. You are showing something that could be interesting for the media. 50% of the poor population of the world lives in South Asia. But you need to be clear that this is half of the picture. The rest of the picture is here. The same with the contributions of the, each one of the dimensions that we're analyzing. Questions? Tomorrow we will have a, tomorrow and the day after we will have two more sessions. One is called clarifying concept. So it's return to this, trying to understand first what we are doing. And the second is institutions and policy. How this happened in real? The, the experience that we have had with different countries, working with them, uh, working with a lot of technical people in, in different countries and trying to deal with politicians.